Science Podcast. I'm delighted to have the the enigmatic, the mysterious <laughs> figure behind the Library of Godwin art that everyone's been seeing. Um, how sh- how should I address you? Uh, I, I well, don't. You've got so many different mysterious names. <laughs> this is my, I guess, my official reveal. My name is Caleb Caleb Williams, um, but I go by Godwin, and that's that's kind of the brand that I do all of my art on. So you can just call me Caleb for now. That's Caleb, not not Godwin Scribe <laughs> or, no. or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. what, what is what is Library of Godwin a reference to? Okay, so that's I, I thought that might come up. So I've actually brought a little bit of a prop. Um, I'm a bit of a, a literature nerd. Most people will probably be familiar with uh, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Yeah. Her mother was Mary Wollstonecraft, who was a, a popular feminist writer, early feminist writer. And her father was a man named William Godwin, uh, a British author uh, and kind of one of the first British libertarians. So he's got some really great write- political writings. But he has one book that he, one of his more famous books is called, and I don't know if you can see, it's called Caleb Williams. Oh, or The Events of Caleb Williams, which is my name. So I actually have this 1838 edition that I hunted through uh, a, a, an antique bookstore out on the border of Wales to find. But um, that's where I got my pen name from, William Godwin, who wrote a book about me 300 years ago or 250 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> there we go. And um, and tell me, you uh, you have an accent. Is it is it an American one? It is an American one. You are from yes. America. I do hail. Yeah, I do hail from America. Um, born and raised there. My dad was in the Navy, so I actually grew up all over the U.S. and and some different countries. But my wife and I met at BYU, and she's from Britain, uh, actually where we are in Cheltenham. So after I finished up at BYU, we moved out over your way, and and that's why we're here. Great. Yeah, I, I did wonder that because we've talked a lot, but we haven't spoken. <laughs> yeah, you've never like heard this. You've never heard my voice. Yeah. Yeah, long overdue. Uh, so, Caleb, you've had this unique idea to follow "Come Follow Me" this year with with weekly sketches of what's happening in Scripture. Um, so, tell me why you well, why did you want to do this? How did this idea come about? Um, partly it was last year as we were getting ready for this year's "Come Follow Me." I thought back to the full cycle, four years of "Come Follow Me," and realized that I was pretty rubbish at, at doing it. I just wasn't very good at following along. I sporadic readings here and there. Um, so I was, I wanted to find a, a better way to involve myself and to immerse in the text. And uh, I love art. It's kind of a way that I channel some the spirit in, in a lot of ways. And so I thought as a challenge to myself, I was going to push myself and every week I would read the Come Follow Me passage and I would find one thing, uh, one event or character or doctrine to illustrate. And I tried to focus on things that I hadn't seen in Book of Mormon art before. And that helped really push me to explore some ideas that um, I think are unique and interesting. Yeah, this this is, um, your style is very unique. It isn't reminiscent at all of, of what we expect from Latter-day Saint art. And I think that's quite refreshing. I think we've seen quite a few in the last several years, um, people pop up with art, say, um, Anthony Sweat's art is is quite unique. We have, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he does the Cubism. Um, oh yeah, um, I'm, I'm familiar. The name's forgetting me. Uh, I think his first name is Jorge, um, but I I don't know the, the other name. And then I, I saw yours come up on Instagram, and yours is more kind of esoterical, ancient looking. It's what you'd expect on the friezes of of a Roman or or Greece temple, Greek temple. Uh, I mean, what inspirations did you draw and how did you develop this unique style of yours? Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's very interesting to look back on the history of Latter-day Saint art and and where we get those influences from. Um, We have to remember that the early saints, the early pilgrims, they didn't come fresh into the church. They brought with them the culture and um, the identity of their previous religions. And for a lot of those early saints, they were Methodists, uh, Presbyterian, Lutherans, um, and a lot of those artistic styles and ideas came along with them. And in a lot of those faiths, 
there there is a bit of a hesitancy or an aversion to depicting religious scenes or figures in a in a certain way. So that's where you get this very toned down, very grounded, realistic. You'll see a lot of nice paintings of scenery or of uh, it's just not very symbolic the artwork. Um, and that's a purposeful part of the religious heritage that I think the early saints brought. Now, my style, as you said, it is influenced a lot by, um, by ancient European history, ancient European styles. So actually, when I was a kid, my dad was stationed in the Navy uh, in Italy. So from ages like six to nine, I lived in, in Italy. And obviously, being in Italy, I was surrounded by the Catholic churches and all this amazing, just marvelous Catholic art, artistic tradition and heritage. And so from a young age, I was kind of brought up in that and I, I learned to love that. And there, there weren't a lot of Catholic converts in the early church um, or Orthodox or these things. So that religious artistic tradition wasn't brought in um, and hasn't really played a big part in Latter-day Saint art, except for in the temples, we do use a lot of symbolism and we do see a lot of the kinds of things that you might see in the Catholic churches, but outside of the temple and our in our church buildings and in our books, you just don't see it as much. So I guess as I was approaching this Come Follow Me, I was taking all of this European religious art that I loved uh, from the early modern period, the Renaissance, and I thought, hey, why don't I bring that style integrated into the restored church and into the Book of Mormon and the restoration and all of these unique and amazing doctrines that we have that that we don't always think about in these symbolic terms or in these artistic terms. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, and that you're right. There is a, so I had a conversation recently with a friend who's an architectural historian and we were talking about symbols in architecture and, and how architecture links with faith and our buildings are very kind of utilitarian that they fulfill a purpose. But, but he hadn't kind of opened my eyes to the symbolic nature of like, well, where are you looking at in your congregation? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I thought to myself on Sunday, well, I'm looking at the pulpit. And he said, is there anything else there? And he, he said, I, well, I, I said, well, we have the, the sacrament table there. And he said, oh, your sacrament table is at the, the front, you know, in, in a sort of altar-like fashion. And he said, well, there's symbolism there, right? There's... That, that's symbolic oh, yeah. because when you look at old Anglican churches and, and Protestant churches, uh, you see how they used to be laid out where the congregation would face each other. And that was symbolic, but then they changed them. So they were facing the pulpit uh, and some would face the, the uh, altar at the back and then they changed the altar. So it was less of a focus and the focus was more on the spoken word and, you know, all of these things. So I do think there's a, there's a pattern in all of that, which is we can we can read a lot of things about where our focus should be, and we can deepen our faith as we as we look at symbols, and that's something I really appreciate about your your artwork. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating to look at. We we take for granted how much our experience with religion and with our theology is influenced by how it's presented symbolically, artistically, architecturally. Um, and just the history behind that. It, it, it's worth exploring kind of that Christian history. And as you say, the, the different designs of churches over the years and how that affects um, the decisions that our designers. One thing I love is just we, we're building all these temples around the world. And there's so many details in every single temple that's unique to the cultural background of the place that it's in, the our architectural style of the region and also our theology and what the temple represents to us. Um, it's really profound. And I wanted to, in my own way, bring that into visual art um, and especially in the book format, because I love the old books with um, engraved illustrations. First, the wood blocks going back to the 1400s and then the metal prints. I, I just, as a, as a kid, I loved flicking through old books that had those illustrations. They were so evocative and powerful and, um, I'm glad I'm, I'm really happy to try to bring that into our, our tradition. So something I've noticed, I actually, speaking of visuals, as we go on, it looks like you're being translated into the celestial I, kingdom. I realized <laughs> that. Like, oh, there we go. <laughs> there we, oh, there we go. Getting brighter and white. There we go. 
thought I'm speaking to a really holy guy here. Um, so uh, something I've noticed actually when observing your art, because um, I've, I've followed your art since basically some of your first posts, I think. Uh, and yeah, yeah. You, you draw the subjects in, in it almost sculpture-like. And you said you were raised in Italy, and I just thought, did you did you have any influence from those kind of going into the the Borghese and the Uffizi Gallery and and seeing those kind of classical sculpture forms and and um, because you know we might see Lehi and how he's portrayed and this, but with you, it's like a really muscular posing figure yeah. like these classical sculptures. Did that have any influence on you? Oh, definitely. A lot of the inspiration when I. When I have a piece in mind, I'll then go and look for poses from um, the old European masters, either in sculpture or in painting. I think there's just a drama that that they were able to portray through those poses, through the the physical stature of the figures. Um, and so I'm not really that interested in grounding my art in a very realistic uh, in a way. I try to incorporate those kinds of power poses that aren't very natural but that carry a lot of emotional weight. Um, and so, yeah, you, you're definitely observing, right? I spend a lot of time on Pinterest or just on Google or from my own travels. I just take pictures of statues all the time in different um, angles and trying to get different perspectives. And that definitely influences my art. I've got this thread on, on Twitter saved bookmarked that I often will go back to and kind of look through again, which is, um, when people were able to turn marble and and stone into silk, you know, when they, yeah, yeah. when they, um, like the, the veiled Christ, we, we were in Napoli recently and we tried to go see it and we didn't realize you had to book tickets in advance, but th things like that, just, they astound me, but tell us your process, um, each week. I, I would love to learn how you go from, okay, I'm sitting down to reading my, uh, come follow me segment of the week to posting, uh, this finished, uh, beautiful piece of art. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I'll just open up the come follow me. I'll look at what I don't worry too much about the topics or the questions in the come follow me. I'm just focused mainly on what are the ch chapters for this week. And then I'll go through and I'll skim through the chapter headings first and see if anything stands out from that. And if I don't quite have a subject from there, then I'll dive in and I'll look. And as I'm looking, I am kind of drawing from that bank of religious imagery and symbolism. Um, it's definitely a language. Sim symbology is a language that you have to study and learn over time. And so as I'm reading, I'm paying attention to that. I'm trying to see what symbols can I draw from this. And usually most weeks, it'll stand out to me what I should do. And I lock in on a certain scene or figure or doctrine. And then I have to start thinking about how I'm going to portray it Sometimes it comes quite easily. It, I can very, I can visualize right away what it needs to be and what the pose needs to be and what the framing. Sometimes I play around. I do three sketches, three different versions, and I play around. Um, and then, yeah, I'll look for some inspiration in poses. I'll go through Pinterest. I'll go through my kind of bank of photos. And then I'll just start. I, I'm fairly quick uh, with my process. I... I'm a very efficient artist, I would say. Once I've got the sketch, I'm just in it and I'm working. And I enter this kind of a subconscious state where I'm just really involved in all the details and all the lines. And that is where I actually, for me, that's a meditative state. And I get a lot of personal revelation and revelation about what I should do when I'm in that state where I'm everything else kind of drowns out and I'm just focusing so carefully on these lines and on these poses and on shadows and light and dark. Um, it's a really profound experience sometimes. And, and uh, it's part of my regular meditation. And that's been a really big spiritual benefit for me. And then I'll get a first draft done. I might leave it for a few days, come back to it, see what details I want to fix. And then I get it ready to post. I do a lot of them in advance. I mean, I had all of this year's done by probably the end of July. And I started in December, so I do. I I uh, I have a high output. <laughs> <laughs> so will, will we definitely. will we see this going on um, as Doctrine and Covenants comes into play and and things as the years go on? Is that your plan? Yeah, I've uh, I've already started on next year's, 
it's going to be a little bit more loosely connected to the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm kind of focused on the Restoration broadly and also specifically on the doctrines of the Restoration. Um, so I, I've already looked through all the Come Follow Me, and I've kind of mapped out a lot of the weeks what I want to do. There will be some weeks where it is just something straight from the Doctrine and Covenants, and some weeks where I'm just taking a short thing from the Doctrine and Covenants and then extrapolating, finding other resources. But I am very excited uh, about next year's process and project. And I even have ideas for the year after that and the year after that, but I try not to get Great. too ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm excited for that. Um, so two things came up from what you were saying before that I would be interested if you had any specific experiences, stories you could share with us. First of times when it was maybe a real struggle to kind of represent visually a concept or, or scripture passage that you wanted to cover. And secondly, um, a time when you experienced or, or when personal revelation played a part in, in a significant way um, for producing a, a piece of art. Yeah. Yeah. One time that was difficult. It's not in the book of Mormon, but I did a, a plan of salvation kind of map that, Gained, gained quite a bit of uh, attention. And that was the third time I had done that piece. So the first time was on my mission, or I started on my mission. And then in the year after my mission, I did this first version. Um, but it wasn't quite right. It wasn't quite there. Uh, I did another one about a year and a half ago, a year ago. Um, but again, it wasn't quite there. And I realized I wasn't diving deep enough I didn't understand the plan of salvation enough to do it justice and to understand the symbolism enough and understand the connections and the implications of all these doctrines. And so that was the time that really taught me the importance of understanding what I was doing. And so when I did it this time around, I was a lot more prayerful about it. Um, I jumped into the scriptures a lot more and into the theology a lot more. And that open the gates where before I was hitting these roadblocks and the symbolism wasn't quite working or the details weren't quite coming out how I'd like this time it flowed a lot more, a lot more smoothly. And that came from understanding, like I said, symbology is a language. So if you're going to communicate in it, you need just like any language, the ideas need to be clear first. So that helped me learn how to do the right preparation. With the Book of Mormon ones, there were a few where it was like that. I had to study more, but um, they were more straightforward. But especially next year, as I focus more on doctrines, um, it's going to be a lot more symbolic, I think, the pieces that I have planned. So it's going to require me doing a lot more study, a lot more prayer, meditation, getting some more revelation. Um, in terms of, yeah, personal revelation... Yeah, it happens quite often when I'm doing these things that I just get, I usually try to put some nice music on. I love uh, Gregorian chants or Orthodox music, these kinds of just very liminal tunes that allow me to just kind of rise above, rise out of myself a bit transcendent. And I'm in this realm between conscious and unconscious as I'm just focusing on these details. And I just regularly will get thoughts, who to contact, um, decisions I need to make in my life, uh, conversations to have with my wife. And a lot of times it just comes in these moments where I'm not focusing on anything in particular. I'm just doing the lines one by one. Um, but I put myself in that spiritual state. So everyone has their different ways that they receive revelation. But for me, I've learned this year that if I really want to get it pure, this process, this artistic process I've developed and I think I've improved over the year is the purest and most direct form. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, I'm reminded when you speak of, of Elder uh, Bishop Todd L. Budge's talk at the most recent general conference about um, being still uh, and meditating more uh, and taking time to reflect on the gospel and taking time in prayer to listen more. And I, I think of the times when I have um, terribly uh, done art <laughs> and sat down and, and done something artistic. And it has been a really deeply kind of, uh, as you described it, a liminal space where, where you're like 
you you're conscious, but you're in kind of a a deep focus, and thoughts are coming in, and and it's a it's a really cool place to be in. So I can imagine that that has um, to do that and to schedule that in so often has probably benefited you a lot in in many ways more than just the creation of these great pieces of art. Yeah, definitely. It's so hard to find time these days to be still and for deep focus. Um, there's just so many distractions. And when you've got the the pen in hand, or I do a lot of it on my iPad, so I've, I've got the Apple Pencil, but when you've got that in hand and you're just so zoomed in on something, um, you enter that deep focus zone that's very hard to find these days. And so it's been a, a great learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. So you have this, uh, you've released this, let me grab it, um, this illustrated Book of Mormon, Let's put that to the camera, which is just stunning. It's really beautiful and it's, uh, it's chunky as well, uh, yeah. full, of, full of different pieces of art within the text. Um, tell us about the kind of decision behind putting this together and the work that it took and, and uh, yeah, what you hope people get out of it, this version of the Book of Mormon specifically. Yeah, it wasn't the plan originally to do something like this, but about halfway through, um, a few people had made comments about it on my work, but halfway through, I was like, you know what, that would be actually really interesting to take a, a public domain text of the Book of Mormon and to put my illustrations in and to make those books that, like I mentioned, I loved growing up. I just loved those old illustrated books. Um, Gustave Dore, he did the Illustrated Bible. It's one of the more popular versions. It's my favorite version. And a lot of people have been able to tell that my style was inspired by him. So yeah, starting in the summer, I found, a, I believe it's a third edition text version of the Book of Mormon on Internet Archive. Um, my background's actually in editing and publishing. That's my degree at BYU. So I love putting books together, the software and InDesign and just the design and, the, and all the process going into making a book. One interesting thing was that the text file... I don't know if it was uh, some kind of AI thing that drew from the scanned PDF and made it into a, you know, a Word document. There were a lot of errors in the text file, uh, just typos, Cs that were translated as Es or things like that. So as part of this process, I had to read and edit the whole Book of Mormon um, wow. word by word to, to, to fix the errors and spacing issues and all these things. Um, and that was a really cool experience because I've never read it so closely word by word. Um, and it was totally new. And also, um, it's not in verse format. It's like the early days. It's in paragraph format. And that also, I think, is a different reading experience. The chapters are also different. They're longer chapters. There's not as many chapters. It's um, the original, I think, chapter divisions in the first okay. edition. That gives it a... For me, that gives it a totally different read. So members who've read the Book of Mormon dozens of times in their lives, when you read it, A, without the verse numbers in paragraph format, and B, where the chapters are divided separately or at a different points, you do get a different perspective. Things pop out at you that wouldn't normally. Storylines or themes or uh, characters connect in a different way. So my hope, my real hope is that this gives a new perspective to the Book of Mormon um, causes us to read it in a different way, in a way that we wouldn't usually have. And hopefully that will help deepen people's testimony of it. I know it, it has for me. Um, and in portraying things in a way that's not familiar, new ways to depict these scenes and these characters, and in formatting the text this way, I think it offers a, an experience that almost feels like reading it again for the first time. Right. Yeah, that's cool. So I was going to ask about the verses. So that was a very conscious thing that you did to to change the the kind of experience to deepen the experience of of reading. Yeah, that's the uh, from those editions they didn't have verses, and uh, I think it gives it a whole new. It just flows differently, um, and it it makes it a lot. The narrative is much. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. it it's more impactful, or it. it drives home a little bit more with verses and with these short chapters just psychologically you have these starts and stops and starts and stops whereas within a paragraph form with long chapters things just connect in a way that you wouldn't have recognized just looking at the verses or at least i didn't 
Yeah, well, I, I was actually pleased to see that you did that because I that's kind of one of my feelings as well is that I kind of, my little hot take that I, I don't think they should have put the verses in perhaps. <laughs> um, but I, I get that it's easy for reference. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but I, I just, especially when you get to these long rolling deep, uh, sermons that we see in so beautifully in the Book of Mormon, which I think is really unique to the Book of Mormon. Um, chopping them up just seems criminal to me, but but no. Um, so I I appreciate that I do. Um, now recently you were in Italy traveling, and yes. you said that you lived there before, and it seemed like you had a lot of um, you learned a lot of stuff on that travel. You've posted about it a couple times. Um, I, what did you learn from that experience about your art and and yeah just tell us what you were learning from your exploration there it sounded really interesting yeah so i i travel for work a lot and uh on my travels i always try to go see these cultural and artistic locations um i gain a lot of inspiration i love seeing different cultures and their cultural heritage um i was in italy and on my on this business trip, I learned I was going to be passing near Ravenna, and I had been hearing on some different podcasts, um, LDS podcasts, about the art in Ravenna and how there's a lot of connections to the temple that you could find. And I was able to just change around my schedule a little bit so that my free day, I would be close to Ravenna, and I took the day and I, I traveled out there. Now, Ravenna is a very unique place. The churches there are from the Byzantine era, so very early Christianity, 4th and 5th centuries. These are some of the oldest uh, churches that we have around, and the art there is really striking. I wrote an article on my website about it on libraryofgodwin.com. I I brought my camera and I took lots of pictures. Now, some people will think that – some people have thought that what I was saying was that the LDS temple endowment – was being practiced by Byzantine Christians in the fourth and fifth century AD. That's not what I think. And that's not what I saw. I think people need to realize that art can carry things a lot longer than language and literature. And so some of these artistic symbols and themes and motifs, I believe survived into Christianity, even when the Christians who made them didn't quite know the meanings. And I believe that in the mosaics at Ravenna, it's all these beautiful mosaics um, in these cathedrals and these baptistries. There's a lot of connections to the temple. The LDS scholars have talked about before, but I went and saw for myself and got to see the different perspectives. You've got very interesting marks in the robes of um, a lot of the figures who are dressed in these white, uh, very Roman-esque robes. You've got these scenes of sacrifice of Melchizedek and Abel out offering up sacrifices to a hand, the hand of the Lord appear, appearing from the clouds. You've got these uh, beautiful depictions of in one of the big churches dur- along the long nave of the church on either side. There's a procession on the left are all the women, these uh, female figures. And on the right are all these men and they've got marks in their robes. The women have veils. And they're carrying crowns and they go all along this very long wall. And at the end, on one side is Christ surrounded by angels. And on the other side is Mary with baby Jesus. Um, But as I've learned about, you know, the temple and the wedding procession that kind of is implicit in the temple ceremonies um, from some of these other great researchers we have on YouTube in the LDS sphere, uh, I saw a lot of amazing connections. So I invite everyone to check out, you know, my photos and do your own research, but it was a a very cool experience. And I I really do think that especially the further back you go in Christian art, you find these echoes of the temple rituals of the early Christian practices that we know have been lost over time. Cause we, we have these apocryphal texts where we see the remnants of these things um, that were just lost over time in the Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. I, I love that they don't only serve as a kind of record of what people are thinking at the time, traditions at the time, but also the depiction itself artistically and stylistically is uh, teaches so much. And, and I wonder if you could speak to that of 
sharing from an artist's perspective of just how art can help us connect to God more and um, connect to the transcendent and deepen our faith and help us understand scripture more. Yeah, there's something just so... Part of it, I think, is that art is a purely creative process. And so that connects us to God in a really intimate way in that that process of creation, of coming up, of taking kind of chaos, all these rough materials that the artist has and bringing them together into something beautiful is something that brings us closer to God. It helps us understand him and it helps us understand ourselves better. It's like music as well. You know, the, the world, I think the world meets you where you approach it. So if you approach the world as this cold, miserable place of suffering, of death, of endless chaos, then that is how the world will meet you. Um, if you approach the world, though, as a place of beauty, of mystery, um, if you allow yourself to remystify your experience with the world, to become like a child and see the world as a child might see it and see the beauty in nature, in music, in humanity, that that's how the world will meet you. And I think that what art does is it helps people to do that. It helps people reorient their relationship to the world, to reality, um, and to God. So it helps, you know, when you're working all day, if you think back to these ancient peoples, when you're working in the mud all day, struggling for every meal, um, that is a cold and cruel world. But that art that they came and gathered and saw once a week, uh, that music that they could hear coming from the chapels, that reoriented them, take them took them out of the mud and out of the, the gritty reality of life and oriented them up towards heaven. It's easy to forget that in a very comfortable modern world. And I think our modern art reflects that. Modern art doesn't ask the viewer to look beyond humanity. It doesn't ask us to look up, um, to think celestial, if you will. Um, but I think that's a shame. I think that we can we can still gain a lot from reorient, reorienting ourselves up towards heaven. And that is what I hope my art can kind of accomplish a little bit. Now, I, you know, I'm always looking at the masters. And so I always fall so short of their skill. I'm always studying the techniques and the compositions and the approach. But my, I guess the thesis of all of my work is that art, beauty is truth. That true beauty connects us to truth. It connects us to God and it helps us look up. And so when we create, when we channel that creative power that comes from God, we should do so with the aim to draw people towards heaven. Mm -hmm. there, there's so much to unpack there. Um, that yeah, I think yeah, really <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I, but I think it's worth um, delving into a bit deeper. And so I, I come from this as one of my first um, jobs out of university was the assistant to a a world-renowned country house painter, artist. Mm, yeah, and yeah. Um, he was called Jonathan Miles Lee, if, if anyone's interested in looking him up. And I, I was his assistant till the day he died um, at 52 from cancer. And so I learned, that was kind of, that was a very formative time in my life about learning about the importance of art, learning about beauty. And even he, he knew his work was great. He knew, he knew how good his work was, but again, Every day he would look to the masters and and really um, again kind of admire them and, and admit his shortcomings in terms of what they were able to accomplish. But I I appreciated that humility in him, and I think that humility allowed the kind of his best work to continue progressing. You know, he doesn't look back and say, "Oh, my best work was years ago." It was it was always an onward thing. But he would always quote Sir Roger Scruton who said, uh, beauty is a value as important as goodness or truth, which um, I've thought about a long time because I'm like, well, what does that actually mean? What does that mean? And you get into that debate of is beauty objective or is it subjective? Is there, um, is there a defined thing in that? And, you know, I, I'm, I think I would say I'm a believer in objective beauty because we see throughout time and history these arts that have stood 
the test of time and and currently we kind of have a a slight dearth of of uh beautiful modern art that really does bring you up to heaven and linking that to architecture um my friend who I was talking about before would say when you see beautiful architecture like an impressive cathedral it glorifies god because it is the best of what man was able to accomplish you know and he recited a a kind of i think it was a kind of baptist hymn where it'd say i'll, I'll use my mind to glorify thee i'll use my mouth to sing praises i'll use my hands um to glorify god and these creations of of music of architecture of art they're all people when they when they are really beautiful um they're people who have done their absolute best with everything that god has given them to make something that glorifies god and so i think when we see those now um there's so much to them in that it's uh, they stand as living testimonies and i think there's something really special and faith promoting about that that's my rant my ramble no absolutely <laughs> yeah that, that's all absolutely true and it's the law of sacrifice in a lot of ways if you think about you know there's yeah. lots of you know the socio political and the economic reasons why cathedrals were built but at the end of the day in an age where food you had to work very hard to feed yourself and running a town or a a nation required massive amounts of resources to dedicate some of your finest craftsmen some of your best stone some of your best artists to build an edifice to god is like a, an ancient sacrifice of giving your best your best animal as a burnt offering um and it's something that survives beyond you that's how you leave a legacy that's how you leave a testimony that stands like stone um for all generations to know that in your life in the struggle that was your life the struggle to get ahead that you dedicated your time and your talents to glorifying god i think it's beautiful it's, it's one thing i really love um living here i love just going around the english churches hundreds of years of just oh, yeah. sacrifice and love of god and of faith and commitment manifest in all of these churches um in so many beautiful ways and I love how the widow's mite story is still today as beautiful as something so grandiose as Solomon's temple, for example. Yeah, yeah. They they share that they share that sacrifice. I think that's a great connector of them all is is sacrifice and effort and care, um, consecration. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting to ponder on. Um, now, for you, how has this experience deepened your faith? I'd love to hear that your personal faith journey um doing this and undertaking these projects. Yeah, it's been really humbling. It's brought me it's just required me to look inward a lot more and to evaluate my relationship with God in a lot of ways. I've always been quite faithful in the church and attending and I I've never really had big faith crises. You know, I've read things that shook me a bit. And then I studied more and, and found my way back. But during COVID it was probably the, when I was the most distant from God or just from my faith, just that time when we weren't going to church regularly, where everything was on zoom. Um, and it wasn't that I lost my faith. It just, it wasn't a very big part of my life. And uh, I I'd grown distant and um, very passive. And so this has been an experience that has really made me get active again in the way that I interact with the gospel. One thing I, I realized and, and as part of my approach artistically is that each generation of the church, I think, needs to make its contribution to the culture and to the art of the church. If you only passively enjoy the art of the past, in the heritage of the past and the hymns that were written in the past, you're no longer a participant in the church and in Zion. You're just kind of like walking through a museum of it. Um, and I think that that sometimes happens with our younger generations is that we think that everything is just the way it's always been in terms of the culture and the traditions and the practices. And instead, I think we should be really involved in, in making our mark on it and honoring the artists that came before, I love 
Arnold Treberg and Minerva Tykart and all of the great artists um, of days past. And I want to contribute to that and uh, be a part of that cultural heritage and part of that story. And I hope that our generation will will learn that we don't just need to be observers of the culture. We don't just need to be participants. We keep the traditions, but we also add to them. We add our own um, that are relevant to our time, to the problems that we face now, to the ideas that we face now. And that is something that I hope a lot of other artists, and I have seen it, but a lot of other artists and musicians and um, writers will contribute to our culture. A living church. Mm. See, I, I agree with that, but I would take it even a step further that it is critical to someone's faith and uh, yeah, yeah. And, and salvation, essentially. I mean, it, ultimately, um, because that is fulfilling the measure of your creation is to is to create things. We yeah. we're here to learn and become like God. And I, I often think when I'm at my desk job of like, man, however way I package this job, I am still typing on a computer <laughs> yeah. even if yeah. i'm like even if i work myself up the the title ranking and and i'm a vice president of operations in the northeast southwest london birmingham central area you know <laughs> it's still yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I, i'm still inputting data uh, and stuff and and so this this question of i need to get myself into something creative because that is who that is my identity as a child of God is a, is a child of the ultimate creator. And I'm, I am on a pathway to creating for eternity myself and, and continuing to do that. And so, I mean, that's why I love doing this because for me, it's, it's that output of, okay, I, I'm, I'm building something. I'm creating yeah. a, a body of work, but I think physical things are even more important. You know, I, you um these traditional th jobs that that people used to do more whereas now as i say it's you, <laughs> we're inputting data a lot but like yeah, yeah. um the the blacksmith in the local village you know creating a piece of work from start to finish and seeing it as i think it's actually so important um so i would implore everyone listening if you don't have that kind of creative part of your life um then do it because as you show you, it will make you so much more intentional about your faith um, and, and deeper in it. Hopefully, hopefully I'm not just yeah. spouting things there. No, that's, that's absolutely the case. And um, working with your hands, like you said, we're just in the digital world. We're very disconnected from the earth, we're very disconnected from our surroundings and everything lives in this digital space. Um, but I really think you have to have some hobby or some creative outlet where you're you're using your talents in the world to help other people, to lift other people up and to glorify God. It's such a beautiful process. It's very enriching to the soul, I think. And as you say, critical. It is critical. Now, to finish off, I thought it would be fun to go through uh, some of your favorite pieces and kind of just pick them apart because they are so rich with symbolism and see where your mind's at. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I have on my, on my phone here, I have your, um, a lot of your work and I'll put them up on the screen so people can kind of follow along, but let us know what's your kind of personal favorite. Would it be the plan of salvation one? Do you think, or do you, do you have oh, yeah, one? Yeah. uh, that one, that one I'm, I was really happy with. Uh, I really liked the the collab one I did just because I thought that was uh, something I'd never seen before. And so I was mm -hmm. really happy with how that one turned out. In terms of the Book of Mormon, the, in the Illustrated Book of Mormon, I was really happy with the Alma 32 about the, the process of faith. Uh, okay. And it's on page 327 of the Illustrated Book of Mormon. We can go into the kind of symbolic details there. Let's do it. 327. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this one, I, people will notice some of my illustrations are more detailed than others. This was one of the ones that was more detailed, took a lot longer. And I, I did several versions of this to get it how I wanted it to be. But I wanted to show um, the process of faith as described in Alma 32 in acting on the word 
and growing it and the fruits thereof. And I think this chapter also really relates to the temple and what we get out of the temple. And there's been some really good uh, work recently about the temple symbology, which I've tried to bring in. So we start on the left and you've got a woman planting the seed. You have the Holy Ghost guiding her or the Holy Ghost is present. So I want in the form of a dove here, but to show that the spirit is what entices us to act on the word and to start that process of faith. Um, it's the influence of the spirit. You have the sun shining down on her. Um, that's also guiding her. And that, that will also be necessary to the nourishment of the seed. You've got this spring that's running by her, kind of the living waters also connecting you to Christ. And then you move a little bit further and you see her pruning and tending to the tree. And in this stage of her faith process, um, there are dark clouds and rain in the background um, to kind of show that the process of growing the word, of nourishing the word in you comes with trials. That's where you're going to meet the, the trials of faith, the catastrophes in your life, um, and what the rains will come and threaten this weak little sapling tree that you're going to have to protect from the winds, that you're going to have to protect from the weeds and the predators. Um, but that as the sun was necessary for the seed, also the rain is necessary for the seed and that growth will come um, from those rains. And that leads you then into the, the third and final stage where the word has grown into a tree, a tree springing up unto everlasting life is what it says in the chapter. Um, you've got the lamb at the base of the tree, which is a, a representative of Christ, just to remind us that all of this draws us to Christ. Um, the tree is obviously also a very symbolic thing in the temple and throughout the Book of Mormon. It's the tree of life with the good fruit um, that is most desirable. I have even a little uh, honeycomb or a beehive rather in the tree. Um, there's also great symbology with the temple and with the beehive and the honey as being sweet. Um, and you have the woman here. She is tasting of the fruit, but she also has brought her children there. And that was to me the beauty of, of growing our faith of nourishing the word is that as we get to taste the fruit and just as Lehi went and tasted the fruit, that the true joy and beauty comes when we can bring our loved ones, the ones who are sealed to us, to enjoy those same fruits and that same beauty and that same uh, richness. And in the background, you see the mountains rising up and the mountain also is that symbol, symbol of the temple. And so that's kind of a breakdown of how I tried to incorporate these symbols. They, on first glance, you might not think anything of a spring or the lamb or the beehive and all these things. But uh, I try to be intentional with all of those details. And that is, those were the things that I gathered when I read that chapter. So that's, that's one of the ones I'm happiest with in this version. Yeah, that is, that is beautiful. And I, and I love that just how visually it represents so much in there, you know, um, you, you could look at that and, and learn so much about it. It's so cool uh, about faith and yeah, it's, it's very substantial. I love that. I hadn't actually seen this one. I'm sure I've probably oh, seen go. it on Insta, on Instagram, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I, I haven't properly looked into it. Um, that's beautiful. Um, to, let's do let's do one more if you don't mind, because I enjoyed that. Yeah, let's do one that you've chosen. Well, you did um, you did the John the Revelator. How about that one? Yeah, is yeah, that, I did that, that one in your class. class. Yeah, let's yes, do that one. Uh, that that was cheeky of me. No, I, I was the one that reached out and, you know, I was looking for another one to add in. And so I reached out and said, hey, is there anything you'd like? So, yeah, that is um, page 34. Nephi, as he's having his vision, he sees John the Revelator and he learns a little bit about his mission and about um, what he does. So what I've done here is I've tried to show some of the, uh, the experience of John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos as he was receiving the Book of Revelations. I brought in some of those classical, uh, the classic symbol of the eagle representing John. You know, you have in classical Christian tradition, you've got different symbols for each of the authors of the Gospels. Um, you have John here. He's got these scrolls behind him of his other writings. One thing you'll notice through the different pieces I've done is that if a figure is having a, a vision of the heavens or something like that, 
I have these flames coming out of their eyes. It might be, seem a little strange to some people, but um, <laughs> I thought that was a, well, one, it's a very kind of symbolic way of representing that experience of seeing with spiritual eyes. Um, and yeah, you have him there peering up into the heavens, seeing the future um, and writing down what he sees. He is kind of surrounded by this white light. And that also is a uh, symbolic of the fact that he um, is not going to taste death, that his body has been transformed. I did the same thing actually later in third Nephi with the three Nephites. Let me see what page that is. They're depicted in the same way. So it kind of connects John the Revelator there to the three Nephites on page 528. They also have flames from their eyes as they're having a visionary experience. And they've got this kind of halo effect around their bodies, showing that their bodies have been transformed and that they will not taste. Oh, yeah. So there's some oh. kind of continuity there um, from beginning to end of the book, showing these figures in this state. Brilliant. So I, I wanted to ask about the John the Revelator one, because obviously I requested it of you. Um, and you never, you always seem silly asking about intentionality for <laughs> to an artist. It's like, you know, when they say like, um, you need to analyze why the sky was blue. And it's like, well, the sky was blue because uh, the writer was having a peaceful day and they were doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, what if the sky was just blue? But um, behind John the Revelator, you have him sitting in front of an arch with a quite clearly marked keystone. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that is that intentional or was that just he's probably sat in an archway kind of thing? Well, it definitely is intentional because it doesn't look like he's sitting in a cave, which is what he actually is supposed to be sitting in. I've given yeah. it a bit more textural detail. I don't remember how intentional it was. It just kind of is how, to me, I thought it would look best. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, you've got the, the arch symbol and the keystone. Um, and those are, as you say, important symbols throughout the Book of Mormon. I mean... The cover of the Book of Mormon also has an arch and a, a kind of a keystone in it as well. And so, yeah, that, that, I guess that was intentional. It could be one of those things where I don't think of it in the moment, but then afterwards I'm like, oh, okay, that, that kind of worked out nicely. Or where the symbols just kind of come through without me consciously um, mapping them out beforehand. That's, that's the beauty of symbolism. <laughs> yeah. even, when you, even when you don't think it's there, you can... You can have some. I, I was thinking maybe you had done that because he was sat receiving this re revelation and it was connecting us to um, the Book of Mormon. It's like the connection for us between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. And yes, so you yeah. have John receiving probably one of the principal revelations of the Bible, um, connecting us to the Book of Mormon, which is the keystone of our religion and uh, all of this. You, you know just no, that that's the beauty of looking at the art you know it's it's um it's exciting to kind of have a look and think for yourself what does this mean to me what do i learn from it absolutely yeah yeah so there we are yeah it's fun stuff so i i, I do hope people can go through and just see what they think the the different images mean try to parse out my symbolism um and i hope it kind of gives them a different perspective on these tales and these accounts that are very familiar to us, but that sometimes we need a little bit of a different perspective on to really appreciate how they might, what impact they might have. Mm -hmm. Well, Caleb, this has been so much fun. Um, thanks for taking the time out to go yeah. through this with us and, and reveal your true self to the world. I know this is a <laughs> exclusive, you get the exclusive face reveal. <laughs> Uh, we should have had you have like a Phantom of the Opera mask on as we started or something. Pull it yeah, off. Yeah, in dramatic fashion. Um, yeah. But uh, tell us where where can people find your work? Uh, where can people get the Illustrated Book of Mormon? Um, your Instagram handle, stuff like that. And what yes. we can uh, expect from you going forward. What's next? Absolutely. So the best place to go, um, libraryofgodwin.com. It's my new website. It's where I've just decided to post everything. So all of the illustrations are on there. If you just want to go and look through all of them, the Book of Mormons and the other ones I've done, there's also a link to buy the Illustrated Book of Mormon and there's links to buy um, physical prints of any of these pieces or digital copies. So that's kind of the, the go-to place. 
can also go to Instagram at library underscore of underscore Godwin, or I believe it's the exact same on X. Um, and on Facebook, I think it's just library of Godwin as well. Um, I am upon request. I am currently working on doing a hardcover version of the illustrated book of Mormon. It's nice. too many pages. It's too many pages to do the full thing. So what I've done is an abridged version that will have just the illustrations. And then on the opposite page, it will have that passage of scripture that relates to the image. And I've tried to make it all kind of fancy and nice, the layout. Um, but I'm excited about that. I think that will be really nice. So I'm hoping to have that out in the next few weeks as an option. And then, yeah, next year, it's full steam ahead. Still planning on doing a weekly post. And there will be some uh, book compilation at the end of next year as well that I've got in mind. Um, so I'm just going to keep going. Marketing genius, getting it ready for Christmas, say. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <we can. laughs> no, thank you so much for coming on the show it's been really enjoyable and glad to finally uh chat to you properly yeah thank you very much for having me thanks for watching for all the saints this show needs your help to grow please like the video comment your thoughts subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it thank you